Now let's take a look at the question. Branchial respiration is observed in the options are fishes, mollusks, aquatic arthropods and option D all of the above. In order to answer this question, we must first know what branchial respiration refers to, right? So if respiration takes place through the gills, then it is referred to as branchial respiration, okay? So what are gills? Gills are special vascularized structures, which means it has blood supply that are used as respiratory organs. Which are the organisms that use gills for respiration? We know that fishes use gills for respiration. Apart from that, aquatic arthropods as well as mollusks make use of gills for respiration. So here's the fish gills shown in this illustration. And mollusk, mollusca is a phylum under the animal kingdom. Example for a mollusk would be snail. And in mollusk, you can find gills which are feather-like present in the mantle cavity. Okay, so they use gills for respiration. Then aquatic arthropods. Again, arthropoda is a phylum under animal kingdom. Example for an aquatic arthropod is a horseshoe crab. Even in horseshoe crab, exchange of gases and respiration will take place through book gills. Okay, so here we were asked which uh, branchial respiration is observed in which of the following animals. Now we know that branchial respiration refers to respiration that takes place through gills and fishes, mollusks and aquatic arthropods. All of them respire through gills. So the correct answer to this question would be option D, all of the above. Now let's take a look at the question. Which of the following conditions is required for inspiration? The options are intrapulmonary pressure is greater than atmospheric pressure, intrapulmonary pressure is less than atmospheric pressure and option C, intrapulmonary pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. Option D, both A and C. Now what is inspiration? Inspiration is the process by which we take in air from the atmosphere into our lungs, right? So that is what this question is talking about. And among the options, you have terms intrapulmonary pressure and atmospheric pressure. Let me first tell you what these terms refer to. Intrapulmonary pressure refers to the pressure of air within our lungs. Intra means inside. Pulmonary relates to the lung. So the pressure that is present inside our lungs is intrapulmonary pressure. Atmospheric pressure, it's obvious that it's the pressure of air in the atmosphere. Okay, so one thing I want you to remember, for air to move into and out of the lungs, for exchange of air or movement of air to take place between the atmosphere and the lungs, a pressure gradient needs to exist. Okay, so what is a pressure gradient? Pressure gradient basically means there should be a difference in the pressure, that is the pressure, uh, atmospheric pressure and the intrapulmonary pressure. If they're both equal, then there won't be any net movement of air. So this question is talking about inspiration where air will move from the atmosphere into our lungs. One rule you must remember is that the movement of air will spontaneously always take place from where there is greater pressure to a region where there is lesser pressure. Okay, so from greater to lesser is how it will spontaneously take place. During inspiration, we are taking in air from the atmosphere into our lungs. So it essentially means that the atmospheric pressure has to be greater than the intrapulmonary pressure for uh, inspiration to take place, right? A pressure gradient, that is the difference in pressure, is required to guide the movement of air into and out of the lungs. The air movement between lungs and the atmosphere is carried by the pressure gradient created between them. Negative pressure in the lungs with respect to the atmosphere. Negative pressure in the lungs with respect to the atmosphere. What does that mean? That means the pressure inside the lungs is less compared to the atmospheric pressure. So negative pressure in the lungs with respect to the atmosphere can result in the movement of atmospheric air into the lungs which is known as inspiration. Remember, atmospheric pressure is high, intrapulmonary pressure is less, air will move from a region of high pressure to low pressure, so movement will happen in this direction, which is what we call inspiration. Inspiration occurs when intrapulmonary pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure. I hope you've understood. Now, can you guess what would be the consequence if it was the opposite? What if the intrapulmonary pressure was greater than the atmospheric pressure? In what direction would the air move? It would move from the lungs 
to the atmosphere and the process is known as expiration. Okay, so expiration occurs when the intrapulmonary pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure. So when intrapulmonary pressure equals atmospheric pressure, I told you there won't be any net movement of air between the lungs and the atmosphere. So this question was asking for the conditions that are required for inspiration, taking in of air into the lungs from the atmosphere. Now we know that the correct answer is B because for air to move into the lungs, pressure outside must be greater. So the atmospheric pressure has to be greater than the intrapulmonary pressure which is option B. Now let's look at the question. Which one of the following statements is not correct? Option A, respiration is the process of exchange of gases between the lungs and the atmosphere. Option B, breathing is an extracellular process. Option C, energy is used in the process of breathing. Option D, several enzymes are involved in the process of respiration. So among the four statements given in the options, there's one statement which is incorrect, which is what we have to figure out, okay? So most people equate breathing with respiration. Breathing does not equal to respiration. I'll tell you what the difference between breathing and respiration is. You know that we take in oxygen from the atmosphere into our lungs and give out carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, right? So uh, this process of taking in oxygen and giving out carbon dioxide is what we call breathing. So oxygen from the atmosphere is taken into the lungs and then carbon dioxide goes out the outside out of the lungs and this process is known as breathing. What do you think happens to the oxygen that we inhale and where do you think the carbon dioxide that we exhale comes from? You have any idea? I'll tell you now. The oxygen that our lungs taken from the atmosphere, it gets diffused from the lungs into our bloodstream and the blood carries oxygen to all all of our body parts, okay, so at the tissues, once it reaches the tissues, the oxygen is delivered to every one of our living cells, okay, so in our cells, what oxygen does is, oxygen is used to perform a process known as cellular respiration, so oxygen is used to break down food like sugar and uh, produce energy in the form of ATP. As a byproduct of this reaction, carbon dioxide is also formed and this carbon dioxide is what we exhale out from the lungs into the atmosphere, okay? So breathing involves taking in oxygen, inhaling oxygen and exhaling carbon dioxide, while cellular respiration involves utilizing the oxygen that is inhaled and breaking down sugar or food uh, substrates and converting it into energy and producing energy out of this reaction. As a byproduct, carbon dioxide is produced and that is what is exhaled during breathing. Okay, so here's a table to show the difference between breathing and respiration. Breathing, like I said, is um, oxygen is inhaled, carbon dioxide is exhaled out of the lungs and the nose. Respiration involves breaking down of food to produce energy, which can, why is that energy required? Energy is required for cells to perform their metabolic activities, okay? So this energy, which is used by cells to carry out cellular functions. Now, breathing takes place in the lungs, correct? Um, so, air exchange or movement of air is happening between the atmosphere and the lungs. Whereas, cellular respiration or respiration, it will take place in every one of our living cells. And breathing is a physical process, whereas respiration is a biochemical process. There are various enzymes involved in uh, respiration. Breathing requires energy. Okay, so it utilizes energy and it does not produce energy. Whereas respiration, the process will produce energy in the form of ATP. I hope you've understood the difference. In the process of cellular respiration, several cytoplasmic as well as mitochondrial enzymes are used to break down the complex biomolecules from food efficiently. Breathing is an extracellular process as it occurs outside the cells, correct? In the process of breathing, contraction of muscles will take place. Okay, so for breathing, movement of uh, air has to take place between uh, the lungs and the atmosphere. For that, changes in intrapulmonary pressure needs to take place. That is achieved by contracting and relaxing certain muscles. Okay, for contraction of muscles during inspiration or inhalation, energy is required. The muscles that are contracting during uh, breathing are diaphragm. It is a doom-shaped uh, muscle that is pre present below your lungs. 
Intercostal muscles, these are muscles that are present between the ribs and the muscles in the abdomen. The contraction of these muscles takes place and contraction of muscles will consume energy in the form of ATP. Okay, so now let's look at the statements. We were asked to identify which is the incorrect statement. The correct uh, answer to this question is option A because the statement in option A is incorrect. It is given that respiration is the process of exchange of gases between the lungs and the atmosphere. So that is incorrect. That is actually breathing and not respiration. Here's an interesting question. Let's take a look at it. In humans, the lungs are divided into separate lobes. Which of the following options correctly represents the number of lobes in the right lung and the left lung respectively? The options are 4 and 2, 4 and 3, 3 and 2, option D, 4 and 1. Okay, so here's an illustration showing the diagram of the lung. We can use this to find out how many lobes are present in each lung. So I will begin with the right lung. In the right lung, there are two fissures that will separate the lung into three lobes. The first fissure is horizontal and is known as the horizontal fissure. And the second fissure is oblique. And this is known as the oblique fissure. Okay, the presence of these two fissures will divide the lung into three lobes. Here is the first lobe which is known as the superior lobe. Superior is upper. So superior or upper lobe. And here is the second lobe, which is the middle lobe. And the third lobe is here, which is known as the inferior or the lower lobe. Now let's look at the left lung. In the left lung, you have only one oblique fissure. Okay, so the presence of this oblique fissure will divide the left lung into two lobes only. The upper lobe is known as the superior or the upper lobe, while this one is the inferior or the lower lobe. Here there is something called the cardiac notch present in the left lung. This is where it, it provides space for the heart. Okay, so that is why it is known as the cardiac notch. So in humans, the right lung is divided by one horizontal and one oblique fissure. There are two fissures into three lobes, namely the superior lobe, the middle lobe and the inferior or the lower lobe. The left lung has only one oblique fissure which divides it into two lobes, the superior and the inferior lobe. So we were asked to find out how many lobes are present in the right lung and the left lung respectively. The correct answer is option C, three lobes in the right lung and two lobes in the left lung. Now let's look at the question, find the correct match. Option A, thyroid cartilage elastic. Option B, cartilages of Santorini, hyaline. Option C, cricoid cartilage, hyaline. Option D, arytenoid cartilage, fibrous. So we have to find out which cartilage is correctly matched with its correct type. Okay. So first, thyroid cartilage. Thyroid cartilage is found, um, it is a cartilage of the larynx. In fact, it is the largest cartilage of the larynx. It is V-shaped. You can see that here. So this here is the uh, thyroid cartilage and it has a V-shaped notch towards its ventral side. So ventral side means front side. Okay, Towards the ventral side, it has a V-shaped notch which is known as the thyroid notch. This type of cartilage is made up of hyaline cartilage. Okay. Next, we have cricoid cartilage. Cricoid cartilage is here. Okay, So this is the cricoid cartilage. It is shaped like a signet ring and it is found below the thyroid cartilage. We just saw how this is the thyroid cartilage. The uh, cricoid cartilage is found below the thyroid cartilage and it is signet ring shaped. This also is made up of hyaline cartilage. Next, we have arytenoid cartilage. Now, uh, thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage, they are single. Arytenoid cartilage is a paired cartilage and they are pyramid shaped. They are present at the upper border of the cricoid cartilage. Upper border of the cricoid cartilage which is like a signet ring and it is also found on the dorsal side. Upper side dorsally. Okay, so they are pyramid like cartilages. There is a pair of them. They are present at the upper border of the cricoid cartilage 
at the dorsal surface of the larynx. They are found behind. Okay. So, they are also made up of hyaline cartilage mostly except there is only elastic cartilage in the vocal processes. The vocal processes are made up of elastic cartilage otherwise it is hyaline cartilage. It is not fibrous cartilage. Okay. As given in the option. Fibrous cartilage is not like hyaline or elastic cartilages. It is very very dense. And fibrous cartilage can be seen in the intervertebral disc between the vertebrae and in the pubic symphysis. Now, uh, another type of cartilage that we can find in the larynx is the corniculate cartilage, which is also paired and it is also known as cartilages of Santorini. Okay, so these are again paired like I said and these are small conical nodules which are made up of elastic cartilage they are located at the upper end of arytenoid cartilage. Arytenoid cartilage is pyramid-like. At the upper end of arytenoid cartilage, you can find these corniculate cartilages. You know that um, the opening of the larynx, the glottis, it is, uh, uh, there's a flap-like structure that can cover the glottis, which is known as the epiglottis. This epiglottis falls on this corniculate cartilage when it closes the glottis. When does it close the glottis? When we swallow, the epiglottis closes the glottis and when it closes the glottis, the epiglottis falls on these carniculate cartilages. Okay? So, these cartilages protect the epiglottis from falling into the glottis cavity. So, among the given options, the correct match is option C, cricoid cartilage which is hyaline. 